about a series of papers that attempts to develop a solution to a well-known open problem in market design. And that, that problem is called uh, combinatorial assignment. So the ingredients of a combinatorial assignment problem are there's a set of indivisible objects to be allocated amongst a set of agents with heterogeneous preferences. Agents' preferences are defined over bundles of the objects. And there's an exogenous constraint against the use of uh, monetary transfers. So my motivating instance, and the one that will uh, feature in, in thinking about practical implementation of my mechanism design ideas, uh, is course allocation at universities. So in this problem, the indivisible objects are seats and courses, so seats in a room like this one. Uh, the agents are students whose preferences are defined uh, over schedules of courses. And the constraint against money is that tuition doesn't vary with the quality of the professors whose classes uh, you take. And this is true even at the University of Chicago. You pay the same uh, price for a, an education at the University of Chicago, whether you take my course or, or a good professor's course. Uh, other examples uh, with a similar flavor are assigning workers to uh, shifts or assigning um, some kinds of, of resource allocation problems in science, but I'm going to focus mostly on, uh, on course allocation today. So combinatorial assignment is one feature removed. It's a very similar looking problem to many problems we uh, know well and understand well, uh, and that have compelling solutions. So if there weren't the restriction on money, we'd have a combinatorial auction problem. We have agents with preferences defined over bundles and we're looking for a sensible uh, allocation. So the, the theory for combinatorial auctions of course traces to Vickery and we have uh, numerous success stories in practice, many of which are uh, associated with Paul. Uh, if we had single unit demand as opposed to uh, preferences defined over packages, we'd have the shapley scarp house allocation problem. Um, applications of which have been uh, and I think of this as, a, as a, a single unit assignment problem, so it's not, not quite as close to, to kidneys as the endowed, uh, endowed problem that, uh, endowed, endowment version of the, sh of the house allocation problem that Al talked about the other day. Uh, but this, this has proved quite fruitful in thinking about the redesign uh, of school choice systems and of dormitory assignment systems. If preferences were two-sided instead of one-sided, we'd have a matching problem. In my problem, agents have preferences uh, over objects, but the objects are objects. I don't have preferences uh, back over the agents. So the theory for matching, of course, traces to Gale and Shapley, numerous successes in practice. And in my problem, the goods are indivisible, and that's going to play a key role in making the problem difficult. If the goods were perfectly divisible, we'd have a classical fair division problem, possibly the oldest uh, problem of them all. Actually, traces, I, I, I trace it here to Steinhaus, but it might, might more reasonably be traced to the Old, old Testament. Uh, so progress on this problem, though, has been elusive. And the, the main reason is that there's a dictatorship theorem for combinatorial assignment, which says that the only mechanisms that are ex post Pareto efficient, meaning they don't leave Pareto improving trades on the table after the allocation is conducted, uh, and that are strategy proof, meaning it's a dominant strategy to report your preferences truthfully, are serial or sequential dictatorships. And there's a series of these theorems which I I cite here. What is a dictatorship in this context? Well, imagine we're assigning students to schedules of courses. We line them up in some order, say Alice is first. So Alice goes first and chooses her favorite bundle of courses. Betty goes second and chooses her favorite bundle of courses out of those not yet at capacity, and so on and so forth, and until we get to poor Zoe, who, who is forced to choose from just the leftovers. So it's easy to see that this is strategy proof when it's your turn to choose. There's no particular reason to have misreported your preferences. By reporting truthfully, you get the best of what's available. Uh, it's also easy to see that it's ex post Pareto efficient. So Zoe will very badly want to trade with Alice, because Alice got to choose from the best courses, and Zoe gets stuck with the leftovers. But Alice is going to have no reason to want to trade with anybody below her uh, in the choosing order. So there, there will not be Pareto improving trades left on the table. Again, we have no monetary transfers. Um, but it's going to be ex post, uh, ex post unfair. I mean, poor, poor Zoe. Yes, did Couldn't you have a money that's only useful for this purpose? That's what I'm going to propose. Oh. <laughs> so that's going to be the way, and that's, um, that's not going to be strategy proof, a monetary. So that it's going to get around the dictatorship theorem with small approximations. So, 
small approximations to strategy proofness. It's going to turn out I'm going to need small approximations to ex post Pareto efficiency. Uh, but I'm going to get uh, approximate ex post fairness. Is that because of the indivisibilities? Because of the indivisibilities. As the indivisibilities get small, uh, the solution becomes a, almost uh, approximately perfect. They are, uh, but the indivisibilities become a source of, and I'll think carefully about how the indivisibilities affect efficiency and also affect fairness. Uh, there's other negative results for closely related problems. Al mentioned some of these in the context of, of kidneys where uh, we have very nice structure in the, in the single unit um, house allocation problem, but as soon as you're allocating both houses and cars, some of the structure falls away. And the impossibility theorems are even more severe if we seek ex ante Pareto efficiency instead of ex post. What I mean by ex ante Pareto efficiency uh, is imagine you don't know whether you're going to be Alice or Zoe. You know, there's going to be some lottery to determine the order in which we choose uh, resources. And allocation is ex a lottery over allocations is ex ante Pareto efficient if there's no other lottery uh, that all agents weakly prefer some strict. Um, so, so one choice is to interpret the dictatorship theorems as prescriptive results. Ken has not made this choice, which I agree with. But this is one, one choice of how to react to, uh, to these results. So, and the, and, and the, several of the dictatorship theorems that I mentioned re kind of reach this conclusion. You know, implications are clear. If strategic manipulation is an issue, one should seriously consider using a serial dictatorship, however restrictive it may seem. Uh, well, although unfortunate, it seems that in many of these applications, the best procedure may well be a random serial dictatorship. Um, this conclusion is not totally un, uh, it, it's, it's somewhat understandable. Uh, strategy proofness and ex post Pareto efficiency are, are central properties in, in market design. And they've been especially central in the theory of single unit assignment, uh, in the theory of top trading cycles, for instance. It's one of the, the, the core of the argument for why we like top trading cycles is strategy proof and leads to a Pareto efficient uh, allocation. And also, there, there's a tendency amongst economists to view efficiency as a serious concern and fairness as a secondary concern when forced, uh, forced to choose. And I think that reflects in some of the quotes I selected on the previous slide. But I, th I think it's a flawed conclusion. Uh, first of all, because fairness does seem an important objective in practice for this problem. So when you look to uh, the, how, the, how administrators who are seeking to assign scarce resources when agents have preferences over bundles and you can't use money, they often talk about both efficiency and fairness considerations. This is a, a, an excerpt from the description of Wharton, uh, University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School's mechanism for course allocation. They talk about equity and efficiency. Uh, and at the very least, if fairness isn't viewed as an objective, it might be reasonable to view it as a constraint, somewhat analogously to a repugnance constraint, uh, where dictatorship levels of unfairness are likely to be a non-starter for practice. And then last, and I think more, most importantly, ex post Pareto efficiency is the wrong efficiency notion for this problem. Uh, ex post Pareto efficiency um, is, is a very weak notion when agents, have mul when agents demand is over bundles as opposed to individual objects, and there are no additional constraints placed on the allocation, such as fairness constraints. So for instance, um, the allocation, if we have non-satiable preferences, the allocation in which one agent gets the whole endowment and everybody else gets nothing is going to be ex post Pareto efficient, even though uh, in welfare terms, it's not going to be very attractive. So my, my own takeaway from the dictatorship theorems is that there's a tension among concerns of efficiency, fairness, and incentives, uh, and that progress is going to in involve some compromise amongst these competing objectives, and that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, so let me talk about the design of a, of a new mechanism. I'm going to talk about a series of papers. Uh, the first of which is mostly empirical and with Estelle Cantillon. Uh, given that the theory is stuck, we try see what we can learn from mechanisms that are actually used in practice. The dictatorship theorems uh, have not corresponded to the actual use of dictatorship mechanisms in practice from this problem. And we're going to use uh, nice data from the course allocation system at Harvard Business School. And then the second paper, and this is the, in a sense the heart of the talk, is to propose a new mechanism uh, based on the lessons learned from the first. And it's inspired by an old idea in general equilibrium theory, the competitive equilibrium uh, from equal incomes. I'll then talk very briefly about a computational procedure for the new mechanism. The, for those of you who have who've studied your general equilibrium theory, we use, have existence theorems uh, based on non-constructive fixed point theorems. We have to find a way to actually find, uh, find approximate market clearing prices for this problem. And this is work that's joint with computer scientists Abe Hoffman and Thomas Sandholm. 
And then I'll talk about an experimental test of the new mechanism at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, joint with uh, Judd Kessler, who's an experimental economist. And then very briefly, I'll talk about the actual implementation of this, uh, of this market design at Wharton. They've called it a course match. That was their choice of name, not mine. My, to me, it's a competitive equilibrium from equal incomes, but I can see why you might choose a different, a different name. OK, so let me talk about the work with Estelle Cantillon. Uh, this is from a 2012 paper in the AER. Uh, in, in practice, we rarely observe dictatorships in which agents take turns choosing their entire bundle of objects. But we frequently observe draft mechanisms in which agents take turns choosing objects one at a time in a series of rounds. So the way sports teams choose new players, both professionally and also uh, in the schoolyard, or the way tasks or shifts are allocated to workers on the walk over this morning, Scott Commoners and I were talking about several board games in which the initial allocation of resources to players in the board game are allocated using some kind of a draft uh, mechanism. And a draft mechanism is used at Harvard Business School to allocate elective courses to, uh, to MBA students, to business school students. The way Harvard Business School's course draft works is that students submit their preferences in the form of a rank ordered list over courses. There's an implicit assumption in this mechanism, which is that you can express preferences using a rank order list, and I think a bit more specifically that uh, preferences are responsive. Uh, students are then randomly ordered by the computer. Uh, so yes? That, that means you can't express uh, conflict. In this, in this mechanism, you can't. In the mechanism I'll develop, you can. Um, but to study this mechanism, we have to I think take seriously that they think that preferences are, are responsive, at least at Harvard, to, to, to make, sense of, make sense of their use of this, this mechanism. But in the mechanism I'm then going to develop, and you'll see that this mechanism has some flaws. It, it has some things to teach us, and it also has some flaws. In the mechanism I'll develop, agents can express arbitrary, in, in theory, they can express arbitrary ordinal preferences over bundles, so including complements and substitutabilities. Uh, in practice, we have to give them some, some language with which to express their preference, preferences, but that language allows for certain kinds of complementarities and substitutabilities. Uh, students are then randomly ordered by the, uh, by the computer, and they're allocated courses one at a time based on their uh, reported preferences and, avail and remaining availability. So in, in odd-numbered rounds, they're allocated in ascending priority order and even-numbered rounds in, in the reverse uh, priority order. And I should say that, that scheduling constraints and curricular constraints, so you can't take two courses that meet at the same time, for instance, that's, that's built into the algorithm. That's actually one form of complementarity and substitutability that's imp important in practice, and that, that's just built in. Um, it, it's easy to show that the draft's not strategy proof. There's an incentive to over report one's preference for popular stuff and under report one's preference for unpopular courses. Uh, the intuition is you don't want to waste early round draft picks on courses that you can get in later rounds. And we have a detailed example to illustrate this phenomenon uh, in the paper, but the, in the intuition should be, should be pretty clear. Uh, it's also straightforward, a, li a little bit less obvious, but straightforward to show that the draft doesn't yield an ex post uh, Pareto efficient allocation in Nash equilibrium. And this is partly for the bundle, ki bundle kinds of preference issues that Eric just raised. But even with, even with responsive preferences, you can construct examples in which you get an allocation that's not ex post Pareto efficient. Uh, so on the properties emphasized by the extant literature, the dictatorship looks more uh, attractive than the draft. The dictatorship is strategy proof and ex post Pareto efficient. The draft is neither. Uh, we're going to study the draft empirically uh, using a simple and, and quite powerful new kind of, of data. So we have. Uh, students' actual submitted rank ordered lists, which are potentially strategic. And this is a kind of data that's commonly available in market design. What preferences did participants in the market submit to, to the market? But we also have their underlying true preferences, their underlying true rank ordered lists from an administration run survey. So if you think about it in an empirical I.O. class, uh, in the analysis of first price sealed bid auction data, for instance, there's sophisticated methodologies for inferring underlying true preferences from observed bidding behavior. And in this particular environment, we just have the underlying true preferences from an administration-led uh, survey. We don't need, to, uh, don't need to infer the underlying preferences. And we do a lot of work in the paper to convince ourselves and the reader that 
that this survey data can be interpreted as a, as a good proxy for true preferences and what the sensitivities are, how to think about sensitivity to small deviations from, uh, from truthfulness. And this combination of true and stated preferences is powerful for a few reasons. So one is it allows us to directly observe strategic manipulations and quantify efficiency consequences. We can ask ourselves, does the lack of strategy proofness actually matter in practice, or is it just a theoretical curiosity? And then second, we can simulate counterfactuals. We can use the true preferences to simulate uh, counterfactual mechanisms. In this, case, in this case, the, the relevant counterfactual is the strategy proof uh, random serial dictatorship. So we can compare, compare mechanisms. We can ask ourselves, should Harvard switch to the strategy proof alternative emphasized by the prior theory? So let me summarize uh, our empirical results. I won't go into too much detail on them. One is that students do, uh, do heavily manipulate the draft in practice. <laughs> So they systematically over-report their preference for popular courses, for courses that other students like, and systematically under-report their preferences for unpopular courses. Uh, and this leads the popular courses to sell out faster, to reach capacity faster under strategic play than under truthful play, for instance. So it's kind of a form of congestion in this market. Uh, second, this misreporting harms efficiency, uh, both ex post Pareto efficiency, meaning the misreporting causes Pareto improving trades to be left on the table, uh, and ex ante welfare, which I'll show you in a, in, on the next slide. Uh, and, and it's a, a misreporting harms efficiency two ways. One is we show that equilibrium misreporting in our data harms efficiency. And second, we show that in addition, students make optimization mistakes, and this causes additional, additional harms. It's a kind of a cost of strategy of using a non strategy proof mechanism. Um, is that if you use a, an, a mechanism that only has base Nash equilibria, is not dominant strategy incentive compatible, and agents can't figure out how to play the base Nash equilibrium, that, can, that failure to properly play equilibrium can be another source of efficiency loss. So, so students do manipulate the draft. It harms efficiency. But nevertheless, the draft looks better on simple measures of ex ante welfare than does the strategy proof an ex post efficient dictatorship. So let me show you some summary statistics to, to just summarize these claims. So I'm going to look at a few different measures of welfare, which we call um, the average rank measure, and we'll also look at the percentage of students who get their, their most preferred overall course. Um, in an economy without any scarcity, uh, since students are choosing bundles of 10 courses, um, without scarcity, I'd get my top 10 most preferred courses. I'd get courses ranked 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 10. So the average rank of the courses I receive would be 5.5, just the average of the numbers 1 through 10. 100% of students would get their number one most preferred course, and 100% of students would get their most preferred bundle of courses, their all, all top 10 of their favorite courses. Uh, if students played the Harvard mechanism truthfully, uh, there is scarcity in this economy. There's, there's genuine, a lot of students want the same stuff that has uh, restricted capacity. So students would get an average rank of below 5.5, it's 7.66. 82% of students would get their number one choice. Uh, when students play the draft strategically, so when they strategically misreport their preferences, uh, that harms welfare what, uh, the as measured by average rank and the percent who get their number one choice. The average rank goes up to 7.99. The percent who get their number one choice goes down to 63%. The percentage of students who get their bliss point actually goes up a little bit. And these are students who mostly like unpopular stuff, mostly like courses that most other students don't like. But there's one or two courses that they like that are popular, and they can strategically misrepresent their preferences to get those, those few courses that are popular, and then they get their bliss point. Uh, under the random serial dictatorship, the average rank goes way up to 8.74. It's much worse. Uh, the percentage of students who get their number one choice goes down to 49%. And the percentage of students who get their bliss point is now 30%. So you can see that the sense in which strategic play harms welfare by comparing these two rows, and the sense in which the draft nevertheless outperforms the random serial dictatorship by comparing these two rows. And in the paper, we have numerous other ways to quantify uh, welfare comparisons. Yes? No, they're, they're underlying true number one choice. So if my true preferences, if my true preferences are two, three, four, five, one, and one is very popular, and I strategic, and two, three, four, and five are very unpopular, 
and I misreport as one, two, three, four, five, well, and I get all five of them, then we'll say I've gotten my true first choice, which was in my example two, and I've also gotten the bundle, uh, my bliss point bundle, which is one, two, three, four, five. Um, so it's yeah, based on un my underlying true preferences. Uh, here's another way to look at the same, uh, at the comparison between the draft and the dictatorship. I'm going to compare the societal average rank distribution under these two mechanisms, uh, where average rank ranges from 5.5 if I get my bliss point up to you know, higher numbers like 20, for, for instance. Uh, under the dictatorship, 30% of students get their bliss point, and then there's a fat tail of students who get poor outcomes. Whereas under the draft, fewer students get their bliss point, about 2%, and then most of the mass is at reasonable uh, quality bundles. The, the mode is about a, an average rank of about 8. Uh, these, two, um, these two distributions, the, the draft distribution second order stochastically dominates the dictatorship distribution. Uh, an implication, and we formalize the sense in which this implication, make this implication precise in the paper, is that a uh, social planner prefers the draft uh, to, dic to the dictatorship if students have average rank preferences and are weakly, uh, weakly risk averse. So, so what, what went wrong with the random serial dictatorship? Why is it unattractive ex ante even though it's efficient ex post? And I want to use a simple example to clarify the comparison between uh, the draft and the dictatorship. Uh, if those of you who know the Bogomolnaya Moulin probabilistic serial paper will recognize this example, but it's a multi-unit demand version uh, uh, of that example. Um, teaching a different, making a different point. So suppose there's four courses, each course has capacity for half the population, and students require two courses each and have the following preferences. So half of the students are P1 types, they like A then B then C then D. Half the students are P2 types, they like B then A then D then C. So what happens under the dictatorship well, if you're in the first half of the choosing order, you get your bliss point, you get A and B. And if you're the sec in the second half of the choosing order, you get the leftovers, you get C and D. And that's in independently of whether you're a P1 type or a P2 type. Because you think of A and B as popular courses that lots of students like, and C and D as less popular courses. And students disagree a little bit on their ranking of the popular stuff and their ranking of the unpopular stuff. So what happens under the draft? Well, students always get their first and third favorite courses. Right? In the first round, the P1 types are taking A, the P2 types are taking B. At the examples designed so that at the end of the first round, A and B reach capacity. And in the second round, the P1 types take C, and the P2 types take D. So all, students always get their first and third most preferred courses. The P1 types get A, C, the P2 types get B, D. Uh, and truthful play is not an equilibrium in general of this mechanism, but in this particular example, truthful play is a Nash, uh, Nash equilibrium. So in terms of average rank, uh, in the dictatorship, the half of students are getting their bliss point, an average rank of 1.5. Half are getting a, a, a poor outcome. They're actually their least preferred bundle, an average rank of 3.5 for a societal mean average rank of 2.5. And in the, in the draft, the average rank is 2. Everybody gets their first and third uh, favorite courses. So the mean average rank is better in the draft, and also there's a second order stochastic dominance relationship between the two distributions of average ranks. And we show that, that uh, the, the features of this example generalize. So, so we call this phenomenon callousness. In the random serial dictatorship, the lucky students with good random draws uh, make their last choices independently of what they're taking with their last choice would have been some unlucky student's first choice. Right, in the example, the lucky P1s take their second choice B, which is some unlucky P2's first choice, and vice versa. And the example generalizes. You could take, there could be 10 good courses and 10 bad courses. And uh, if students wanted 10 uh, bundles of 10, the example would, would generalize naturally. Right, so the students callously disregard the preferences of those who choose after them. Now, ex post, since there's no transfers, the random serial dictatorship is Pareto efficient. But ex ante, this behavior is bad for welfare. The benefit to the lucky is small. The harm to the unlucky is large. Uh, and an important note is that the unattractiveness of random serial dictatorship uh, doesn't actually depend on uh, risk preference. Do doesn't depend on risk aversion. Um, if students were risk loving, they might like ra random serial dictatorship. But even risk neutral students are going to regard a win a little, lose a lot 
lottery as, uh, uh, as unattractive. And that's the kind of lottery that random serial dictatorship induces. So there's a few lessons I want to take from this mechanism that I'm going to then use to inform development of a new mechanism. Uh, the, the first concerns fairness and welfare. A, a sensible prior, and I think the prior in the dictatorship theorem papers, is that switching from an all, the all at once ex post efficient random serial dictatorship uh, to the choose one at a time ex post Pareto inefficient HBS draft would be good for fairness. Instead of some students getting everything they like and others getting none of what they like, we're spreading things out more, more equally, uh, but bad for welfare since the dictatorship's efficient. Uh, ex post and the, and the draft is not. But in non-transferable utility settings, ex post Pareto efficiency is a very weak property. Uh, and the lottery over Pareto efficient allocations induced by the random serial dictatorship is very unattractive when assessed uh, ex ante. Uh, so much so that the HBS lottery over inefficient allocations looks more attractive ex ante than the um, random serial dictatorship lottery over ex post Pareto efficient allocation. So there, there isn't an efficiency fairness trade off in this between these two mechanisms. And I think more importantly, ex post Pareto efficiency can be a poor proxy uh, for ex ante welfare. Um, and that's something, something to keep in mind. Uh, a lot of papers study ex post Pareto efficiency, and in non transferable utility settings, it can be, it can be a misleading guide. Um, a methodological point I should, I should make on this slide as well is in the paper we develop uh, n simple but new techniques for how to make s precise statements about ex ante welfare on the basis of ordinal preference data, on the basis of rank orderless data. And hopefully those, those tools can be useful in other applications. Uh, the second lesson concerns strategy proofness and practical market design. Uh, our, our field data allow us to directly document that students at Harvard Business School strategically misreport their, set, their preferences. And these are real life participants in a one shot high stakes setting. And moreover, we can show that this manipulability harms efficiency, causes congestion, harms welfare. So these findings are strongly consistent with the view that strategy proofness is, is an important desideratum in, in practical market design. Uh, but, yes? So you, you showed uh, that they are manipulated. Mm -hmm. uh, have, you, have you analyzed how, how effectively they're ma manipulated? Uh, do they, yes. Do they get equilibria of the manipulation? Yeah, so that, that's something we can do. Um, there's, so the, so the, there's a little bit of nuance to the answer. Assume that, assume that the data we have is perfect in the sense that we have students' actual true preferences, the, the survey is not without noise, and we have actual strategic play. Um, we, we have some characterizations of equilibrium in the paper. I don't want to go into them in this, I, didn't, I chose not to go into them in this talk just for, uh, for the per, uh, purpose of time, and also it's not a natural segue into what follows. But we can, char we can make precise state, we can make characterizations of the equilibrium relationship between true preferences and strategic play, even without a full understanding of Bayes-Nash equilibrium in this mechanism. Uh, so we can identify certain kinds of play as consistent with equilibrium behavior and certain kinds of play as inconsistent with equilibrium behavior. And that's not a full classification, but, but we have some necessary conditions for equilibrium behavior. And then we can classify some students as making what to us are clear mistakes. And then we can we can compute the welfare cost of the clear mistakes. So I, in, the, in, in the average rank measure, for instance, um, under truthful play, students, the, average, the societal average rank was 7.66. Under strategic play, the societal average rank was 7.99. Uh, under equilibrium play, so fixing the mistakes, the average rank is in between at 7.80 something. So we can, do, we can do some of what you ask for, but it's, our understanding of the Bayes-Nash equilibrium map from a rank ordered list to, uh, to from a rank ordered list to a rank ordered list is incomplete, partially because we don't have all of the preference data. We just have ordinal preferences over individual objects. Bayes-Nash equilibrium play depends on my von Neumann Morgenstern preferences over bundles, and we have only partial structure over that. But, but one lesson mm -hmm. might be that, that even if students were playing. Mm -hmm. Even if they were manipulating, per, yeah, optimally, if would, welfare would still, on average, be lower. 
lower than under truthful play. But truthful play is a non-equilibrium benchmark. Right. So, so we can debate which is the right. Yes, that's right. The right welfare benchmark. That might, that might be so, yes. That, that's, that's right. So both strategic play and optimization mistakes harm welfare in this setting. Uh, so constraints, constraints have costs. So strategy proofness is a constraint. We find that the welfare costs of using a strategy proof dictatorship appear to be larger than these welfare costs Eric is asking about a, 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 of manipulability. And I should mention it, there's a class of mechanisms uh, in which strategy proofness characterizes dictatorship. So the classes uh, choose one at a time types of mechanisms. So there's not a general in general, to get from strategy proofness to a dictatorship, you need additional properties like ex post Pareto efficiency and then other, other kinds of, of milder properties in each of the papers I mentioned. But there's a class of mechanisms in which there's a, a map between strategy proofness. Strategy proofness implies dictatorship. So you can interpret the cost of strategy proofness as using a dictatorship. Uh, so overall, these results suggest a nuanced view of the role of strategy proofness in, in design and the need for second best alternatives. And so one thing I've been working on that I won't really discuss today is a notion of second best, a second best notion of approximate strategy proofness with Eduardo Azevedo that we call strategy proofness uh, in the large. Um, the third lesson is, is where to look for better mechanisms. So, so one takeaway is that the the, the HBS draft is very simple to manipulate. Overreport popular stuff. Um, pract practitioners often fail to take incentives seriously. That's a common mistake market design practitioners make. Um, the prior literature took incentives extremely seriously. It, it, it imposed ex exact dominant strategy incentive compatibility uh, as the incentives criterion. And I think a, a, a sensible takeaway from the analysis is to seek a middle ground, to take incentives seriously without imposing the most orthodox uh, criterion of, of incentive compatibility as a non-flexible requirement. Uh, and then a second lesson is to take fairness seriously, to take, take ex post fairness seriously, to seek a mechanism that yields a relatively equal distribution of outcomes like the draft and unlike the dictatorship. This avoids the dictatorship's critical flaw, which is its ex post unfairness which is not it, per se undesirable, but also harms uh, ex-ante welfare, as I showed. So with that, let me segue to the next, uh, next paper. Um, the first three papers I'm going to talk about, by the way, are, were published in reverse chronological order of, of their intellectual priority. Uh, that's a quirk of the economics publication process and the computer science publication process. But this is a, a paper on what I call approximate competitive equilibrium from equal incomes. So, so the goal of this paper is to produce a mechanism that's attractive with respect to efficiency, fairness, uh, and incentives. It's missing from the prior theory literature for this problem, and it's also missing from practice. This paper proposes such a mechanism. It's guided by the previous. And it's going to get around the impossibility theorems by making several small compromises versus the ideal properties we'd hope a mechanism would satisfy. And it's based on, on an old idea called competitive equilibrium from equal incomes, which is attributed to uh, Duncan Foley and Hal Varian. So I'm going to be a bit more formal in the presentation of this uh, paper than the previous one. Uh, there's a set of N students, we'll call a generic student, uh, student I, a set of M courses, generic J, uh, with integer capacities. So these, um, these you know, the Q, QJ tells us how many seats there are in, in course J. Uh, there's no other goods in the economy. In particular, there's no numerator good. Um, each student I has a set of permissible schedules, psi I. So psi I encodes what sets, what bundles are legal for me to, to consume. And then a utility function uh, over all possible bundles into the reals, but impermissible schedules have a utility of zero. And preferences over permissible schedules are strict. And then I'm, I'm not going to place other restrictions on preferences. Uh, in particular, uh, students are free to regard courses as complements or substitutes. Although one, one restriction I should mention is that a schedule is a vector of zeros and ones. I, I either take, for each course, I either take it or I don't. And that, that structure will actually prove, uh, prove a bit helpful. Uh, an allocation x just assigns to each student i a, a vector, a vector or set of courses. It's actually sometimes convenient to use vectors, sometimes sets. Um, and an allocation is feasible if it satisfies uh, capacity constraints. Yes? So there's no randomization in your model? 
Well, I'm just giving you the primitives. Um, I haven't I haven't gotten to mechanism design yet. There will be there will be randomization in the you, randomization is a choice you make at the stage of designing a mechanism, not at a stage of describing the environment. Right, but the agents have to evaluate random. I mean, maybe they have to evaluate. Well, this is a von Neumann Morgenstern, yeah, utility function. But you know, even without state, I mean, the, we can decide whether the mechanism is random at the stage of the mechanism right. design. Um, an economy is a, a tuple that tells you all this stuff. Um, so what does competitive equilibrium from equal incomes mean? Competitive equilibrium from equal incomes is a, oh yes, go ahead. Um, in, in this setup, the restrictions on capacities are encoded by the psi i's. Um, so in, in practice, what does psi i encode? It encodes that you can't take more than five courses in a semester. You can't take two courses that meet at the same time. You can't take math two until you've already taken math one. So th this, this object is an arbitrary subset of the set of all vectors of zeros and ones. So it, it, it's pretty general and it allows for a maximum number of courses in a bundle. And that maximum number of courses in a bundle will actually be an important parameter uh, in the approximation result. So I'm going to call that k. So think of k as five, five courses per semester. Uh, other, yes? You, you could. I mean, that's a, that's a, yeah, zero is a legal consumption bundle. That's, that's important for a, a boring technical reason. So, uh, different students getting different number of courses is also fine. Yes, that's fine. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a pretty flexible setup. You'll, uh, it allows for, it, the, it allows for preferences over complement, uh, complementary, complement substitutes. No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, it's like there is no minimum quota constraint that you have to take one course. No, you, you could encode that using the psi i's. You could choose not to. But, but, but if you would like to encode this, I mean, basically mm -hmm. need to make an accept, uh, how do you say, incognitable schedule with no courses. So you need to make uh, a schedule with no courses. Mm -hmm. But you say that it's not allowed. Sure. So, oh, sorry. So I, I, think I, I think I see where you're going. So suppose you had an economy where there was two courses, uh, there's A and B, and I'm only permitted to take both, and you're only permitted to take both, and there's only room for us to each take one. Uh -huh. So there's an implicit assumption that the economy has sensible, feasible allocations, and that, that's discussed, mm -hmm. discussed in the paper. But mathematically, the simplest way to do that is to assume that taking zero courses is a feasible schedule. Mm -hmm. And what's a way to interpret that in practice is if I, take, if I get zero courses from the mechanism, I then fill my schedule with stuff that's got spare capacity. And in practice, every course allocation problem has numerous courses with spare capacity so students can get the five courses they need. But there's kind of an implicit assumption that there's some slack in the economy. That's a, that's a good point. Um, OK. OK, so what would competitive equilibrium from equal incomes mean in our environment? And this is a, a, a beautiful classical old idea. And it's a celebrated solution to fair division of divisible objects. Uh, described by uh, Christian Arnsberger as an economist's vision of ideal of, of perfect justice as the foundation for an important theory of fairness due to Ronald Dworkin. What, what would it mean here? So agents report preferences over bundles. They're given equal budgets, call it B star of an artificial currency. Uh, find an item price vector P star such that when each agent's allocated her most, of, most preferred affordable bundle, the market clears. And then we allocate each agent their demand at P star. This would be a great mechanism if it worked. It would be Pareto efficient by a first welfare theorem. It would be envy free because everybody's getting their most preferred uh, bundle at, at the realized price vector. Uh, but, but existence is a problem, right? So imagine that everybody in this room has the same ordinal preferences uh, over schedules. At any price vector, we all demand the same bundle. So every good has demand of either zero or n, where n is the number of agents in the economy. So existence is, is, a, is a, a big problem. Market clearing error could be large. So I'm going to define a notion of approximate competitive equilibrium with two approximation parameters, alpha and beta. And I'm going to say that a, a, an allocation budget and price vector uh, constitute an alpha beta approximate competitive equilibrium from equal incomes if the following three conditions hold. So first of all, each student is allocated exactly her most preferred uh, affordable bundle. So the, in notation, I'm given the bundle 
xi star that maximizes, is, is, is maximal with respect to my utility function over the set of all bundles that are affordable by me, where the price of the bundle is weekly less than my budget. Um, second, this is where the alpha parameter comes in, uh, mar the market clears to within Euclidean distance of, of alpha. Um, so market clearing error is small. What do I mean by that? Well, markets clear exactly if when the price of a good is strictly positive, demand equals supply, or when the price of a good is zero, demand is weakly less than supply. And I'm going to just define market clearing error as, di as distance from this ideal. So if a, if a course is strictly positive price, for instance, uh, market clearing error is the difference between demand and supply. So if this room has 65 seats in it and we allocate 63 students uh, and it has a strictly positive price, error is 2. Uh, if we allocate 67 students, error is 2. And I'm going to require the Euclidean distance of this error to be, to be smaller than alpha. And then I'm going to say that the ratio of the maximum to the minimum budget uh, is smaller than uh, be 1 plus beta. So you can, without loss, without loss, normalize the minimum budget to 1. The maximum budget is then 1 plus beta. So an exact competitive equilibrium from equal incomes would have alpha equals beta equals 0. Same budgets, no market clearing error. It's defined, this is defined for, in, for my environment, which has indivisible goods. Yep. Uh, so the theorem says the following. So let, this is, this is the existence theorem. Uh, let K be the maximum number of courses in any permissible schedule. So this comes back to the question from earlier. Think of K as 5. You can take at most 5 courses. And define parameter sigma equal to the minimum of 2 times K or M, where M is the number of, uh, of, of courses. For any strictly positive beta, so for any strictly positive amount of budget inequality, there exists an approximate competitive equilibrium from equal incomes that clears the market to within market clearing error of root sigma m over 2. Um, so the, the result of the theorem is that market clearing error is at most uh, root sigma m over 2, which is in, in two senses small. Uh, so first of all, it doesn't grow with the size of the market as measured by n, the number of students, or q, the capacity vector. So as we grow the number of agents or grow the number of copies of each object, the worst case bound for market clearing error uh, does, not, does not similarly grow. It doesn't depend on either of those two quantities. This, this relates, my, my, my result is, in the, is a descendant of a famous old result of Ross Stars for the existence of uh, general equilibrium, uh, e existence of competitive equilibrium, approximately so in economies with continuous but non-convex uh, preferences. And, and second, market clearing error is small in the sense that it's actually a small number uh, for practical size problems, especially as a worst case bound. I'll show you some numbers on that in the next slide. Uh, with equal budgets, so beta equals zero, market clearing error could be arbitrarily large. So the theorem tells us that a little bit of budget inequality uh, goes a long way. And at the other extreme, you can think of a dictatorship as exact competitive equilibrium, from, but from wildly unequal incomes. So Alice's budget dwarfs Bet Betty's budget, which in turn dwarfs C's budget. So Alice can buy everything she likes without having to worry about Betty's, without, without the planner choosing prices, having to worry about Betty's price, uh, preferences. Uh, the theorem also tells us, I didn't put this formally in the theorem statement, but that the market administrator can assign these close but unequal budgets to agents however she likes. So for instance, uniform randomly or based on some pre-existing priority order like seniority or grade point average. So think of budgets as living between 1,000 and 1,000 plus epsilon and the administrator deciding how to, how to choose these budgets. Um, so I, I want be, with, with Arrow in the room um, and Arrow have, having the existence results for uh, competitive, regular competitive equilibrium. I want to spend two slides just giving the key ideas uh, in, in my proof for existence of approximate competitive equilibrium. I'm not going to go through the full details. The, the paper actually does have a, a, a two or three page reasonably plain English sketch of the proof. And then the formal details are in an appendix. So for those interested, I would encourage you to consult, uh, consult the sketch. But the, the basic difficulty re relative to this standard existence results 
Are their agents' preferences or agents' demands are discontinuous with respect to price because of the indivisibilities? If you change price a little bit, my demand bundle could change a lot because I'm consuming zero or one of each, each object. So going from zero to one, that's a big change for a small change in price. Uh, the role of the sigma parameter is that sigma tells us about how large an individual agent's demand discontinuity can be with respect to price. So let's say I, I demand bundles of at most five courses. The worst case discontinuity for an individual agent is that I go from demanding this set of five courses to this set of five courses, completely disjoint. That's going to have a Euclidean distance of square root 10 because a bunch of ones are going to zero, five ones are going to zeros, and five zeros are going to ones. Yes? In the, uh, in the opening lecture here, I, I showed how in a simpler setup like mm -hmm. than this, with where people are just demanding one mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can get rid of the discontinuities and uh, mm -hmm. non-convexities by, by allowing people to, uh, to randomize their demands. Yes, yes. Their demands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. making, making so the, the, a couple thoughts on that. Um, so with bundles, so Paul, Mil Paul Milgram and I have a paper that looked at the use of lotteries in, and this was with Fajito Kojima and Yunkuche as well, the use of lotteries in multi-unit demand problems, so in a, a, a lottery type approach to a problem such as this one. And there's a, a nuance is that in the single unit demand case, a a lottery describing the probability with which each agent I gets each object J can be resolved as a deterministic allocation uh, by use of the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem. So if we have a, a matrix with N agents and M objects and entry IJ tells us with what probability does I get J, we can then implement that assignment matrix. Um, with multi-unit demand, there's, yeah, so we have, yeah, we have a, Yeah, so there's some papers in the, on, yeah, so we have a paper from the 2010s on, <laughs> hopefully our paper, you know, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we could talk about it, talk about it offline. But there's, so there's some limits to what you can do in terms of preferences over lotteries for bundles. So in particular, let's say there's three agents and three objects, A, B, a, B and C. Uh, the lottery in which I get the bundle A, B with probability half and otherwise get nothing you get the bundle BC with probability half and otherwise get nothing, and Ken gets the bundle AC with probability half and otherwise gets nothing, cannot be implemented. Uh, because of the, if, if any time I get A and, a and B, um, there's no room for either of you to get anything because you only have preferences defined over the bundles. Um, so there's limits to what you can implement. Um, but subject to those limits, there's, there's some progress you can make, and we, we make that progress in, in a paper I'll tell you about about offline. Um, Can't you randomize over feasible allocations? Can't you randomize over feasible? You're saying that yes. these individual randomizations, mm -hmm. you can randomize over collectively over feasible allocations? Yeah, so I mean, ex ante efficiency would, so it, here's a problem that no one knows how to solve yet. Um, we know how to write it down, but no one's figured out uh, how to solve it yet. So take, take, take a Meyerson-like problem of maximize social welfare subject to resource constraints and incentive constraints. But we're, we're not allowed to use the dual to that problem to support the initial allocation with, we, we can't use monetary transfer. So the usual trick in combinatorial auction problems of using the dual to the initial program to get prices which we can use to support the allocation in the first instance can't be used. Um, so we, we, we haven't figured out how to solve that problem. The basic difficulty is how do you not provide agents with incentive to report that their utility from their most preferred bundle is infinity, which in a, in, a, in a naive optimization problem would then give them their most preferred bundle. So we haven't figured out good ways to encode incentive constraints. Um, in so then if we put a budget constraint, so, so here, here's a mechanism you find in practice that looks like it's trying to do um, well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about that in the next set of slides, the mechanism in practice. It's, um, but the, the, I think a, 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 a broader answer to your question is there's a problem that we'd like to know how to solve but don't know how to yet, which is 
maximize ex-ante social welfare subject to technolo technology constraints and incentive constraints. And that remains an unsolved problem. So, what, so the, the dictatorship papers have just looked at ex post Pareto efficiency as a constraint, dominant strategy incentive compatibility, and then they get an exact characterization so they can solve that problem, but it's not the problem we want to solve. We want to solve the ex ante welfare problem. Um, so think of what I'm doing as, as in the direction of the problem we'd like to solve but don't know how to solve yet. Um, so the role of unequal budgets uh, in this existence theorem is to mitigate how individual agent demand discontinuities aggregate up into aggregate demand discontinuities. So if agents have the same budgets, uh, my choice set can change at the same point in price space as your choice set changes. So if you think of, think of a price space, an m-dimensional price space, uh, budget constraints can be expressed as hyperplanes. What is the hyperplane of prices at which I can exact, some agent I can exactly afford some bundle X? And my, my budget constraint hyperplanes are identical to your budget constraint hyperplanes if we have the same budget. And budget constraint hyperplanes tell us where does an agent's choice set change. And that's where discontinuities can arise. Uh, so an economy can have large discontinuities of aggregate demand with respect to price. They can be of magnitude uh, n root sigma. Take that case I talked about earlier where we all have identical preferences. Then if, our if there's some small change in prices that changes our choice, we're all going to change at the same time, at the same ch change in price. Whereas if we give agents distinct budgets, that's like spreading apart the these hyperplanes, these budget constraint hyperplanes, we can change some agents' choice sets without changing all agents' choice sets. And then the maximum magnitude of the discontinuity in aggregate demand is reduced to m root sigma, where m is the dimensionality of the, uh, of the price space. So in, in two dimensions, for instance, we, instead of having all n agents' budgets overlap at any point, we can ensure that at most two budget constraints overlap at any particular point. Um, so at this point, we could apply an, an, an approximate fixed point theorem to get market clearing error of at most m root sigma. The, the bulk of the proof, the, the rest of the proof, is reducing the worst case bound uh, to root sigma m over 2. Um, this part of the proof exploits the, the structure of aggregate demand in a neighborhood of any p. Because we're, um, we, can, we can change any one agent's, in, in a neighborhood of any price, we can if agents all have distinct budgets, we can change any one agent's choice set without changing any other agent's choice sets. And this lets us make zero one decisions agent by agent on what, whether they can afford or not afford bundles local to P. And this gives a nice geometric structure to aggregate demand in a neighborhood of any P. It's called a zonotope, which is a fancy parallelogram. Um, reducing the Reducing the bound from m root sigma to root sigma m over 2 is, is valuable for practice. So in a semester at Harvard Business School, m 50 sigma is 5. So m root sigma would be error of 112. Root sigma m over 2 is, is worst case error of 11. So in giving a worst case performance guarantee, it's useful if the worst case performance guarantee um, is, is, a, is a reasonable number for practice. So a Euclidean distance of 11 is... Uh, is a, is a relatively small amount of market clearing error for practice. So let me give a simple example to both further explain the existence theorem and give you a sense of where I'm going to go with the fairness results, uh, in which there's, there's two agents and four objects, two of which are valuable diamonds, a big one and a small one, and two of which are ordinary rocks, a pretty one and an ugly one. And each agent requires the most two objects. And in this example, they have identical preferences and the preferences you'd expect given the names of the objects. So in a dictatorship, we have fairness problems because whoever is first gets both of the diamonds. Uh, in competitive equilibrium from equal incomes, we have existence problems because at any price vector for any objects, either both agents demand it or neither does. If my budget's one and Ken's budget's one, the big diamond costs weakly less than one we both wanted. If the big diamond costs strictly more than one, neither of us can afford it. Approximate competitive equilibrium from equal incomes is we randomly assign the two agents' budgets of 1 and 1 plus beta for beta small. And then we set the price of the big diamond to be 1 plus beta, for instance. There are other prices that work, but, but think about that one. And then set the other prices such that the poor agent gets small diamond pretty rock and the wealthier agent gets uh, big diamond ugly rock. So we can spread out budgets. Now we can change whether Ken can afford the big diamond without changing whether I can afford uh, the big diamond. 
Um, so budget inequality helps us to recover existence. Exact existence in this example, approximate existence uh, in general. So now let me turn to criteria of outcome fairness, uh, foreshadowed by the example. So in, in fair division, the, the two most important notions of ex post fairness or outcome fairness are, are fair share guarantee and no envy. Um, let me just define each, each briefly. Uh, so suppose the goods in the economy are perfectly divisible. An allocation satisfies the fair share guarantee if each agent gets a bundle that he likes better than just his one over n share of the endowment. And an allocation is envy free if each agent gets a bundle that he likes better than any other agent's bundle. I don't envy, I might not have gotten my bliss point, but I don't envy what you got. Uh, in divisible goods economies, competitive equilibrium from equal income satisfies both criteria. That's the heart of the heart of the argument for CEEI is it satisfies these two criteria and it's Pareto efficient by a first welfare theorem. Uh, but fair share is not well defined within divisibilities. One over n of the endowment isn't a well defined concept. We can start thinking about lotteries, but that, that, that turns out to be a, a little bit, I'll, I'll show you a more natural way to resolve the indivisibility problem in, a, in, a, in the next slide. Uh, and envy freeness is well defined, but just it's too strict a, a too strict a property. It's going to be impossible to guarantee. Uh, if there's some single star professor or a big diamond, um, someone's going to envy uh, someone's going to envy another person. So there have been several previous approaches to to grappling with outcome fairness and in the presence of indivisibilities. So one approach is to allow for money. Uh, another approach is to assume that indivisible goods are actually divisible in a pinch. So, so, so Stephen Brams has written a lot of papers that are described as being about indivisible goods uh, resource allocation. But if you look at the details, if needed, we can find ways to divide the indivisible stuff. Um, or we could assess criteria of outcome fairness at an interim stage as opposed to ex post. So interim envy freeness, for example. Uh, the common thread in these previous approaches is we can either modify the problem or the time at which fairness is assessed and then apply traditional criteria I'm going to keep the problem as is, but weaken the criteria to accommodate indivisibilities. So I'm going to first weaken fair share. I'm going to say an agent's maximum share is a consumption bundle uh, d defined as such. Let me just describe it in words. Um, take all of the resources in the economy, uh, out, divide them into n bundles, x1 through xn, so as to maximize with respect to my utility my least preferred with respect to my utility of the end bundles. So imagine I'm dividing the resources in, th in the economy into end piles and being left with the, the pile that I prefer least. So I'm playing divide and choose against adversarial opponents. I'll call that bundle my maximum share and I'll say an allocation satisfies the maximum share guarantee if every agent gets something they prefer to that bundle. Um, so this is a, a, a Rawlsian kind of guarantee. Um, and coincides with fair share if goods are divisible and preferences are, are convex and monotonic. Uh, an aid allocation, I'll say, satisfies envy bounded by a single good. If for any two agents, I and I prime, either I likes his bundle better than I primes, or I envies I prime, but you could eliminate the envy by striking some single object from I prime's uh, consumption bundle. Okay? And this is going to coincide with envy freeness in a limit as indivisibilities become arbitrarily unimportant as things become divisible. Uh, in the diamonds and rocks example, approximate competitive equilibrium from equal income satisfies these criteria. So each agent's maximum share is, well, if I'm dividing a big diamond and a small diamond, I'm going to put them in different piles and then also deal with the rocks. That's my maximum share. Uh, and each agent gets at least a, a bundle they like at least as well as that. And then the agent who gets the worst of these two bundles envies the agent who gets the big diamond, but the envy is bounded by a single good. Uh, and that example also tells you the limits of this criterion. Right? If, if the big diamond is infinitely valuable, then saying that envy is bounded by a single good isn't a very, it's not a very strong claim. Um, what the dictatorship does is it gives some agent both diamonds. Right? So it, give, it, it creates more envy than is necessary uh, given the level of indivisibility in the economy. Uh, in single unit assignment problems, incidentally, uh, dictatorships actually satisfy these criteria. And dictatorships are frequently used in single unit assignment problems like house allocation uh, or school choice. 
So I think the fairness properties help us to, to make some sense of the empirical patterns of dictatorship usage, so a useful external uh, validity check. So let me give you two um, fairness theorems for approximate competitive equilibrium from equal incomes, which I'll, I'll sketch each briefly. Uh, so if, if budget inequality is small, smaller than 1 over n, um, and, and we have a competitive equ approximate competitive equilibrium from equal incomes, then x star guarantees each agent their n plus 1 maximum share, which is a weakening of the maximum share based on dividing goods in the economy into n plus 1 piles, not n piles. So let me give you a brief sketch of the proof. Uh, the, the, these, the, the existence proof is long. These proofs are, 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 are pretty compact, and I think the intuition can come across clearly. Um, if budget inequality is small, then even the poorest student has uh, at least 1 over n plus 1 of the income endowment. Uh, there's n students, and they have almost equal budgets. Uh, if P star is an exact competitive equilibrium, then the goods endowment costs weekly less than the income endowment. So if P star is an exact comp competitive equilibrium, each student can afford some bundle in any n plus 1 way split. So each student can afford some bundle weekly preferred to their n plus 1 maximum share. And then the full argument's a bit messier because of the approximations. Uh, theorem 3 says that if, if budget inequality is small, then uh, approximate competitive equilibrium from equal income satisfies NV bounded by a single good. Again, the proof has kind of a, f uh, a, a familiar uh, feel to it. Uh, so suppose I envies student I envies student J, uh, normalize the lowest budget to 1, so I's budget's at least 1, I can't afford J's bundle, J can afford J's bundle, and J's budget can't be that much bigger than I's budget. Um, so since J's bundle contains at most K goods, one of them has to be heavy. One of them has to cost at least 1 over eight, uh, K minus 1. And I can afford this bundle, a bundle uh, formed by removing one of the heavy goods. So I must weakly prefer her own assigned bundle uh, to some uh, bundle formed from J's by striking a single good. OK, so what, what's the mechanism? Uh, students report their preferences. They're given approximately equal budgets. Uh, say uniform random draws from 1 to 1 plus beta. Uh, compute an item price vector P. I'll talk about the computational procedure in a few slides. Um, and allocations anonymously, such that when each student's allocated her most preferred bundle in her budget set, the market approximately clears. And then allocate each student her demand at, at, that, at that price vector. Um, so th this mechanism is not strategy proof. In f oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, they're reporting the type. So in practice, that's going to be a crazy assumption. Uh, in the, for the def and I'll, in, for, but for, the, for mechanism design, it's standard to say agents report their type. And that's yeah, and that's a utility function. But in practice, we're going to give agents a language with which to report a reasonable amount of information about their preferences. Okay. So it's, this mechanism is not strategy proof for the same reason that the Walrasian mechanism is not strategy proof. It's strategy proof in a large market sense. Students ignore their own influence on prices. Uh, at any price is P, a student's happiest with their outcome from reporting truthfully is U. But if by misreporting is U hat, I perturb prices to P hat, I might prefer U hat's outcome at P hat to U's outcome at P. So if I know the way in which misreporting my preferences uh, affects prices, I might be able to profitably misreport. Um, if I were playing this mechanism, I would report, uh, report truthfully. Um, there, you can, in in multi-unit uh, auction, a uniform price auction, you can, you can have a good intuition for how shading your demand is going to affect price. And this problem, because your demand for each good is either 0 or 1, it's a, 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 yeah, let me, I'll leave the details on that to the paper. But, uh, but it, it's exactly strategy proof in this large market sense. Um, so it's stra strategy proof in the large. Um, other mechanisms that are not strategy proof but are strategy proof uh, in the large are deferred acceptance, the Walrasian mechanism. Um, so what are the properties of this mechanism? It's ex post efficient by a first welfare theorem, but, but for market clearing error. It satisfies these two notions of, of outcome fairness. And it's strategy proof in a large market sense. Agents who can't affect prices uh, can do no better than to report their preferences truthfully. So this is an approximation to what we ideally want. We ideally want ex post efficiency, or really ex ante efficiency, outcome fairness. Um, and exact strategy proofness. We can't get that. We have impossibility theorems. Uh, so it's an approximation to what we ideally want. Uh, so I do two additional pieces of work in the paper 
uh, to try to further convince you that this is a good approximation. Uh, one, and I'm quite, quite proud that this got into the final version of the paper, is just go through all of the other mechanisms from theory and practice and tell you about their properties. I don't expect you to be able to read this slide, but I encourage you to consult, uh, consult the paper. But for every mechanism I know from theory and practice, I tell you its efficiency properties, its fairness properties, its incentive properties, and what preference language it uses. And every mechanism from prior theory and prior practice has a, has a big problem with respect to either uh, fairness or incentives, or some, often both. Now the second thing I do, and this requires telling you a little bit about how to compute uh, prices, is, is I analyze the performance of the mechanism on data. Uh, so let me briefly tell you about the mechanism for computing prices and then what we can do with it on, on data. Um, so the, the existence theorem shows that approximate prices exist. It doesn't show how to find them. Proof's non-constructive. Think of this as like a scarf problem but with indivisible goods and, and complementarities. Um, so we develop a computational procedures for, for finding approximate market clearing prices, joint with computer scientists Abe Othman and Thomas Sandholm. And it's a, it's a two-level procedure where at any price vector P, uh, there's an agent level where at any price vector P, I compute agents' demands at that price vector. And that's a knapsack problem. At a price vector P, I'm looking for a vector of zeros and ones that maximizes my utility subject to budget uh, and permissibility constraints. This is NP hard, but it's doable in practical size problems, and you can parallelize. You can solve each, each student's problem uh, on its own chip. Um, so this is very parallelizable. And then there's a price level, which is searching through a large price space for a price vector such that when each student solves their knapsack problem, the market approximately clears. This is kind of the hard part in practice. Um, and we use a, a search method called taboo search, which you can think of as a, um, an enhancement or a fancy version of a tatoma process. Um, we have no guarantees that this is the right computational method. Um, it, works, it works well on the data I'm about to show you. It works OK in practice at Wharton. Uh, but it would be great to have a better method. We had to budget a whole week. Um, to give ourselves enough time to ensure that we found approximate market clearing prices. And then we still don't know if we're finding the best approximation we can. Um, so that, if there's computer science oriented students in the room, so there, there's several open questions raised by this, this work, and that, that's one of, the, one of the clean ones. Do you get the uh, demand functions, not, not just the demand, mm -hmm. but the derivative of the demand? Mm -hmm. So I, I think so. Yeah. So we. we I, don't know how practical we are, I think they. I think they are. The, so there's some differences between the structure of demand in this problem and what we're used to from from Scarf's problem. The main difference in structure in structure is that each agent demands zero or one copies of each object, and that's what. And that's helpful in some ways. It's actually helpful for the existence theorem. But it, it, it means that a lot of our intuitions from what we do in, 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 in more traditional looking competitive equilibrium problems don't quite translate. But, we, we, but I don't have a theorem that says that that's the wrong approach and this is the right approach. It's just this is what we came up with that seemed to work on data. It's a, it's a good question. So what, what can we do with this on the HBS data? So one, we can just show that market clearing error is small. So the mean, mean market clearing error in the, in the data with, with Cantillon is one seat in six courses uh, out of 50 courses and about 5,000 seats per semester. So an implication is that uh, market clearing error is about an order of magnitude better even than the worst case bound, um, and outcomes are nearly ex post efficient. We can analyze fairness. So in, in the data, students always obtain exact rather than approximate maximum shares. Envy is rare and small. So about 1% of students in our data have any envy. Although the caveat is that our preference data is pretty limited. Um, so I don't want to take that 1% figure too seriously. But. And then third, we can look at ex ante welfare. So the theory is about ex post Pareto efficiency. Uh, but we can also look at ex ante welfare using the data. And the distribution of utilities for my mechanism, first order stochastically dominates that from the HBS draft mechanism that I showed you earlier, which itself second order stochastically dominates the distribution from random serial dictatorship. So an implication is a utilitarian social planner should prefer the new mechanism to these alternatives. 
So even if we don't care about fairness, we should like, uh, like this mechanism. Yes? Do you have the percentage figures uh, from before? Once again, also for this EDI system. The percentage figures, so. Which you were showing before. The, the table, uh, how much went for each sheet with each of the mechanisms? With the oh, the, um, I don't have those handy. Um, I, I have them reported in the paper, but I don't, I don't have them handy. Now, one of the issues actually is that the, the, to run the computational procedure fast on my workstation as opposed to on a fancy, on a more uh, a fancier computing environment, I have to use one semester at a time. And the numbers I showed you from earlier are for the full year problem, which is two semesters. So there's not, there's not an apples to apples figure to give you. Um, so it's a computational procedure that works, but it's not, it's, there's limits to what, yeah, to what, that, that, that's also analysis I ran three years ago. It's possible that I, I, Abe's, Abe's enhanced the method a bit to have it work in practice at Word, and it's, we, could, we could revisit. Okay, so I, I have about 20 minutes left. I'm going to tell you quickly about two additional things. So one is um, an experiment we ran uh, at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania testing uh, my mechanism against the mechanism the Wharton School had previously been using. And can this, the, the mechanism the Wharton School had previously been using is a, a different type of auction that I, I, don't, I don't think this is what you were asking about, but this is another attempt people have made to try to get at um, those kinds of intuitions. And you'll see immediately that there's a, a, a simple flaw in, uh, in this mechanism that Wharton had previously been using. And then I'll just I'll spend the last five minutes or so just talking about some lessons, uh, lessons from practical implementation. Okay, so Wharton had previously been using a mechanism called the bidding points auction. Uh, this, alongside the draft, this is the most prevalent mechanism used in practice. It's used at a lot of business schools, including my own booths and, and Wharton. Um, here's roughly how it works. So students are given equal budgets of an artificial currency. Uh, not approximately equal, but exactly equal. So we all get 10,000 points. Uh, we use this budget to bid for seats and courses. I bid my points on different stuff. If a course has Q seats, the Q highest bidders for that course get it and pay their Q plus first highest bid. So think of this as a multi-object Fikri auction, but with fake money. Um, so how is this different from competitive equilibrium from equal income? So to a casual observer, uh, they look pretty similar. They're both trying to use artificial price systems to get market-like efficiency properties from uh, in an environment where you can't use real money, it makes a mistake. Uh, the mistake is that it treats uh, fake money as if it were real money that enters the utility function. So it treats a general equilibrium theory problem with a fiat currency as if it were an auction theory problem with quasi-linear preferences over goods and, and money. Uh, and this creates an incentive to misreport, which creates inefficiency and fairness problems. So suppose that a student I has a budget B and faces a price vector P that the money's fake and has no outside use. So their correct demand is we maximize over all bundles X the student's utility subject to their budget constraint, P dot X less than B. The bidding points auction gives them the bundle that maximize the, maximizes the difference between their reported utility and their expenditure over fake money. So as an example, if I want goods A, B, and C, and I bid 7,000, 2,000, and 1,000, and the prices are 7,000, 1, 2,000, 1, 1,000, 1, the auction helpfully interprets you as not wanting any of these goods at these prices. The, the bundle that maximizes the difference between your reported utility and your expenditure is the empty set. Um, whereas in a competitive equilibrium, so what would your correct demand be if these are your utilities and these are the prices you face and you have a budget of 10,000? Well, you can't afford everything, but you can afford, say, goods A and B. Um, and this zero courses issue actually materializes in, in practice. Uh, so here's a student who bid, uh, this is from, from Booth, from University of Chicago. Here's a student who bid in their, their last semester of their MBA, um, 54, 66, 5,000, 1,501 for courses that cost 57, 41, 5104. So each price is a little bit higher than their bid. So they graduated with a large budget of unspendable fake money. So th this would certainly be a problem mm -hmm. in, your, in your last semester. Yes. So if you allowed for intertemporal substitutability, yes. then, then, it's a, then, yeah, then, it be, then this auction doesn't, doesn't 
it doesn't look so bad. So I think the right, so if, if we played the game, if, if we played infinitely many times, if we had infinite repetition, then money would, fake money would always have a future use. So we, I don't think of the fake money in my pocket as fake because it always has a future, it always has a future use. If we play the game a single time, then this critique is exactly right. And if we play the game twice or four times, then we kind of don't know what equilibrium looks like. But it's certainly not the case as claimed that it's a Vickery auction and therefore you should report your preferences truthfully. So it's, it's at the very least, it's a hard, it's a hard game to play, but it, it's, it might be less bad than I'm making it out to be. That point's well taken, yes? So I, I, I interpret this as they're, they're trying to do the best they can given uncertainty about what the prices are going to be. And this student would, ex post would have, try, would have preferred to bid differently. But there's a deeper question of can you express preferences using this kind of language? And that's, that's, a, that's a deeper and harder question. We're going to assume they roughly can for the purpose of the experiment. Um, so th these kinds of problems, I'm going to go through this paper very quickly. I might just give you the highlights. These kinds of problems began to manifest in practice at Wharton. as an article from the student newspaper, Top 10 Reasons Wharton Students Hate the Auction. Uh, one is even with historical prices, it's hard to know what to bid. So this student probably was bidding based off historical prices, and this year's prices were different from last year's prices. Uh, I could have bid all of my points, and I still wouldn't get the thing I wanted the most. Well, that's, that's a problem I can't solve. Uh, um, Figuring out what to bid takes forever. There must be better models out there. So the Wharton administration then convened a committee, not caused by that article, but kind of in parallel to, to, to a lot of grumbling on campus and in the administration to evaluate new uh, course allocation mechanisms. Um, and G Gerard Cachan is the hero in this story. He was the, the chair of that committee. He's a, a, a big guy in operations uh, research and the chair of the operations research department. Uh, at Wharton, he sends an email to the Wharton faculty at 9.34 on a random Tuesday. Judd Kessler, my co-author, emails me 11 minutes later and says, you want to test something? And we, um, we proposed, we, we brought my theory to the attention of, uh, of Wharton, of Wharton administrators, and we suggested an experimental test. So, so what, conceptually, why run an experiment? What might we learn from an experiment that we don't already know uh, from theory? So one issue, and this was raised in the discussion, is preference reporting. So the theory um, in, 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 uh, in the previous paper assumes that students report their types, which we're used to doing in mechanism design. Uh, here, an ordinal, a type is an ordinal ranking over all possible consumption bundles. It's a whole function. It's crazy to think that students can accurately report, uh, report their complete preferences, a full utility function over all possible consumption bundles in practice. So will the theoretical benefits of the mechanism manifest when we use a real reporting language? That's one issue. And then the second issue is that we were worried that a work of mathematical economics on its own, with lots of approximations running around, um, with approximate fixed point theorems, was unlikely to convince deans to adopt a new mechanism. They might worry that the theory missed something important for them. So um, two metaphors are you look for side effects and kick the tires. So in, in FDA drug approvals, the first thing you do is you figure out, does this drug have some unintended side effect? Is it even safe for humans before we figure out, is it effective relative uh, to other alternatives? That's a, that's a subsequent test in the FDA drug approval process. Um, so we wanted to allow Wharton decision makers to see the theoretical benefits of the mechanism manifest in a Wharton-like environment. Um, so these issues dictated the design of our experiment. We used real Wharton students, reported preferences over schedules of real courses, uh, used a professionally designed user interface, and we correct, co collected an unusually broad range of data, both quantitative data and qualitative response data. And let me just give you the, the results. So quantitatively, competitive equilibrium from equal incomes outperformed the Wharton auction on measures of both efficiency and fairness. But we found that students had difficulty with preference reporting. A lot of students made uh, preference reporting mistakes. What did you ask them to report? Okay, good. So 
Well, we asked, let me, given, the, given that I won't get through the whole talk, let me just tell you. Um, what we asked students to do is um, we, a, we, we asked students to report their, their true preferences where we, we, and we told them the mechanism, it, it gave them incentive to report truthfully. We suggested that they report their true preferences uh, over bundles of schedules. Actually, there's, there's, two ver there's two questions you're asking at once. Um, so let me answer both of them. One is what language did we give them to allow them to report their preferences? Um, and then second is how did we figure out whether they reported their preferences accurately or not? Um, so the, the language, I'm going to skip around if that's, that's okay with you. Uh, so the language is we instructed students to submit a value of between 1 and 100 uh, for any course section they were interested in taking, 100 for their most preferred course, and then all other values relative. Um, we instructed that, uh, so the, 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 the trick is that cardinal item values over individual courses induce ordinal preferences over bundles. And ordinal pre we don't need von neumann morgenstern preferences over bundles to run this mechanism. We just need the ordinal preferences over bundles. Because at, at any realized price vector, we need to know what your choice would be. Uh, so from any choice set, we need to know what your choice is. So, 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 so then, then we allow them to enter what we call adjustments, which are a limited form of additional expressiveness. So, so far, just additive. And then we allow students to enter pairwise adjustments. They chose the Wharton administration liked pairwise. They didn't like setwise. Setwise would be, in principle, arbitrarily expressive. You could express arbitrary ordinal preferences over bundles if with so, so let me first define pairwise. So pairwise is I, I get utility of 100 for course A, I get utility of 80 for course B, and if you give me both A and B, that's worth an additional plus 30 or an additional minus 180. And you can express certain kinds of complementarities and certain kinds of substitutabilities with that language, but by, by no means can you express all such preferences. Um, setwise would be, well, if I get A, B, and C together, that's worth an additional plus plus or minus whatever number you like. That would allow for full, in, in principle at least, full expression. Um, pairwise was thought to be simpler and enough. This was hard to do. In another way of doing it would be allow, allowing them mm -hmm. uh, to, to say something directly about two bundles. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer a bundle A, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, th so, so we gave them this language where they could report item pre uh, preferences for each individual item and then make these adjustments. And then we gave them a, a widget, and this widget actually got very positive feedback for what it's worth um, in the qualitative discussions with students, where we, we showed them, well, based on what you've told us, here's what we think your 10 most preferred schedules are. And then they could interact with the, with the user interface to say, oh, well, this actually isn't a accurate reflection of my preferences, let me, let me change the numbers I'm telling you. So, and students reported that this kind of interaction between the language they were providing us and then what this meant in terms of ordinal preferences over bundles was, was quite helpful in refining the, the item-wise information they were reporting to us. So for instance, this is my most preferred schedule based on what I reported with a schedule value of 200. This is my second most preferred schedule with a schedule value of 193. Um, so that's the language we provided to students. And then we wanted to assess, well, can students report their preferences accurately using this language? So what we did was we had them report their preferences using this language. And then after the fact, we showed them pairs of schedules using an interface similar to this one and said, of these two schedules, which do you like better? Um, the assumption being that reporting utility function is hard. But choosing between two schedules and reporting which of two I like better is, is cognitively simple. And then we could test for consistency between the reported preferences and the peerwise comparison uh, responses. And we found that students often made a lot of, they had a lot of inconsistencies. So to give you a sense of magnitudes, um, uh, so one result was that the 
competitive equilibrium from equal incomes outperforms the Wharton auction on measures of envy. So on the Wharton auction, uh, students, 42% of students had envy of another student's schedule. So when I asked, which do you prefer, the schedule you got or the schedule Eric got, 42% um, of students for some alternative student preferred some other student's schedule. And we didn't frame it as, do you envy Eric's schedule, but we just showed them two schedules and they liked yours better. Uh, under competitive equilibrium from equal incomes, it was lower, it was 31%. Um, but if students had reported their preferences with perfect accuracy, so if we took the preferences they reported to the system as sacrosanct, didn't just ask them, do you envy Eric's schedule, but just said, well, based on the preference information you reported to us, do you envy Eric's schedule, it would have been 4%. So that gives you a sense of magnitudes for how much we were doing better despite preference reporting mistakes, but we could have done a lot better if um, we could fix the preference reporting mistakes. With respect to efficiency, um, we can't, Pareto efficiency is hard to measure in this environment, but one thing we can do that's simple is just ask students which schedule do you like better, the schedule you got from competitive equilibrium from equal incomes or the schedule you got from the Wharton auction. Um, using the pairwise comparisons, it was 57 to 43 uh, in favor of the competitive equilibrium from equal incomes. So a significant difference from 50%, but modest, it would have been 69% if we could fix the preference reporting mistakes. So again, we, the mechanism won, uh, it was enough to persuade the decision makers at Wharton, but there's a lot of work left to do to get preference reporting to be, uh, to be accurate. So just the re let me give you the rest of the results and then I want to show you a couple highlight slides. Um, I only have three minutes, so I'm going to defer questions to the coffee break. Um, so the re rest of the results, so, so the competitive equilibrium from equal incomes outperforms the Wharton auction on quantitative measures of efficiency and fairness, but students had difficulty with preference reporting. Uh, the upside is if we can improve the accuracy of preference reporting, it improves mechanism performance. Uh, qualitatively, uh, competitive equilibrium from equal incomes improved students' uh, perception of the strategic simplicity of the mechanism. So questions like, did you feel like you had to um, understand historical prices to make decisions, uh, decisions in the mechanism? Uh, and overall satisfaction with the mechanism, but it reduced transparency and understanding. One of the things we found that we didn't fully anticipate was that, I guess in retrospect, it sounds obvious, students find a mechanism based on approximate Kakatani fixed points to be a bit harder to understand. Uh, it was a, a, adopted for use starting last fall. So the, the experiment was successful in the Roth sense of whispering in the ears of princes. Um, and results from the experiment have guided implementation, especially around uh, preference reporting and preliminary indications have been uh, pretty positive. So let me skip to the conclusion slide just to show you these um, preliminary results from practice. Um, Well, it's a lot to, it's, it's, this is 10 years of work, so it's hard to condense it into an hour and a half. Um, so we, we couldn't do a full before and after comparison of year one because the Wharton auction is not strategy proof. Uh, we would need some way to recover student preferences in the pre-year to evaluate uh, student welfare. So the idea, ideal would have been to do, do what Estelle and I did. So use a survey, get tr underlying true preferences from the initial mechanism, um, run competitive equilibrium from equal equal incomes as a counterfactual and compare student welfare. But we're, in, I think, quite reasonably worried that a survey of true preferences would be confusing in the year right before they were switching to a truthful uh, mechanism. Well, I, I shouldn't say rightly, but they, they did worry about it. Here's what they did do. So one is they can just compute a Gini index of the distribution of the price of students' final schedules and the, in the before year to the after year. So competitive equilibrium from equal incomes reduced this measure of inequality quite a bit. They looked at, I think this is a little bit more convincing, they looked at the distribution of the top 20 most preferred courses. In the Wharton auction, 31% of students got zero, 6% got three or more. In competitive equilibrium from equal incomes, 13% got zero and zero got three or more. So the, the for any one student, we can't tell if they like these courses or not. We don't know their true preferences. 
um, because we don't know what their true preferences were in the pre-year. But this suggests that the most valuable stuff in the economy is getting distributed uh, quite a bit more equally. Um, we, they also ran a, an annual student survey. Um, so with respect to allocative efficiency, they asked, I was satisfied with my schedule from in, in the pre-year the course auction system and the post-year the course match system. This went up from 45% to 64%. Uh, the court, this system allows for a fair allocation of classes, went from 28% to 65%. And overall satisfaction went from 24% to 53%. And then I want to spend two minutes of the coffee break just giving you a sense for how Wharton explained this system to its, its students. So I think this is quite interesting. When thinking about real market design, one of the, so we're, we're, we're getting from a theory with words like approximate Kakatani fixed point theorems and zonotopes in it to explaining a new course allocation mechanisms to MBA students. A lot of translation has to happen along the way. So I just want to, without going into too much detail, just give you a sense of how the mechanisms explain to MBA students. So what do we need to do? We need to match students to seats and courses. That's why it's called course match. What's the goal? We're trying to maximize student satisfaction. We care about efficiency, fairness, envy freeness, and procedural efficiency. Um, What's the problem with the current system? There's allocation errors, there's inequity, it's time consuming. Uh, we have a whole team. Um, it's theory based and experimentally tested. Um, they, here's the theory based part, so they very nicely cite all of my papers. Um, here's the experimental test that I just described, but too quickly. Um, so 132 Wharton students, they participated in, an old, in the new system and an old system. Uh, they did survey questions, they compared stuff. In all eight sessions, the majority of students preferred their course match schedule over their auction schedule. There was significantly less envy. Students reported qualitatively that there was less strategic thinking and it was simpler. Um, and students reported it was important to better understand how to use the system. This is preference reporting mistakes. And they worried about black box perception. So this is why we are rolling out an extensive education campaign. So how does it work? Three steps. You report your preferences computer does some stuff, and then you get your, um, your most preferred affordable schedule at the, at the computed prices. What does it mean to report your preferences? Well, there's some stuff you're really excited about. There's some stuff you're not excited about that has the broken hearts. Um, and you should report high utilities for stuff you're really excited about. Um, and then these item-wise utilities induce preferences over bundles. This is their way of explaining how the reporting language works. So if you report these item utilities, that tells us that you like B plus C better than A plus D. Um, you can, preferences for combinations. So you can, I like this one and this one, but I really like the bundle. I can have a, uh, an adjustment for getting the pair. Um, I really don't like the bundle. I can have a negative adjustment for getting the pair. What can you afford? Well, you get a budget. Preferen this is trying to avoid confusion between the old system and the new system. So preference points are not, you're, you're reporting preferences, you're not bidding your budget. Um, again, preference points are not bids, so they're trying to go through the metaphor of a shopping agent. You're reporting preferences to a, a shopping agent who will shop for courses on your behalf at the realized prices. Um, this is an example to show what the set packing problem looks like. So here, if you have a budget of 5,000 and these are the prices and these are your preferences, what's the What's the utility maximizing bundle for you given your preferences and also scheduling constraints? You can go through this and why, explain why you get what you do get and don't get what you don't get. What's the op optimal strategy? You should tell the truth or risk not getting your best schedule. Why? Because course match is your buying agent. If you really want A but you say I really want B, it's going to try to buy B for you. Um, doesn't it pay to think strategically? No. You can influence the clearing price. You're only one of 1,600 students. This is large market strategy proofness. Um, don't I need to think about how other people are going to behave? No. See the previous slide. Do I need to forecast stuff? No. Okay. Um, does it guarantee that I'll get my most preferred class? No, there is not a 100% guarantee that you'll get your most preferred class. There is a 100% guarantee that you'll get the course schedule that maximizes your reported preferences given your budget. This is what budgets are, what happens. After course match, there's an adjustment period. Where are we in the development process? So at, this, at the time this PowerPoint was conducted, they were explaining the system to the students but hadn't fully developed it yet. Now it's fully developed and it's been 
I've been live for two semesters. And it's been a lot of fun. Let me, uh, let me break there. I'm a few minutes over. Happy to take questions uh, over coffee. Thanks.